Hey Islanders, I hope you're all having a fantastic day as well as I honestly hope you're all as pumped up as I am about learning how to use data visualization with Python. For those of you brand new to the community, my name is Will and welcome to the Islander Robotics community where we're using Python to learn applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence through demonstration. So with all that being said, sit back, relax with your favorite snack and let's get started. Right, so welcome to the second video of the data pre-processing series. Honestly, this is going to be a video filled with a lot of information and a lot of cool stuff. So get your notebooks out and why don't we start talking about what today's video is really going to be about. In the last video, I showed all of you how to use data discovery to find in the ins and outs of your data, really to get an understanding of what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses. Now what we're going to be doing today is actually taking all that information we learn and physically visualizing each individual aspect of our data set, giving us an even further in-depth understanding of our data set. The way that we're going to be finding out this information and visualizing it is we're going to be using matplotlib. A good pointer to point out that today's video is not a full well, a full tutorial on matplotlib. There's so much information inside of that module that there's no way one single video could actually do that. So go ahead and leave a comment down in the description bar down below if you like a kind of like a video series on matplotlib, but today is just really to give you the, the basic understandings of matplotlib to allow you to have the ability to use data visualization with your data set to create all sorts of machine learning and artificial intelligence models. And as so, I know the past few videos we've been really fixated on the pandas module. However, matplotlib really does excel in its ability to create all sorts of different figures. Like for today, what we're going to be doing is actually using the histogram feature of matplotlib as well as in combination of pandas pandas in order to give us the ability to view the data within each one of our columns in a more digestible way. And the way we're going to do that is first by opening up a the script I got up right behind me. And the very first thing we're going to be doing is importing all the modules we're going to need for today's video, which in our circumstance is going to be, you probably guessed it, matplotlib. More specifically, we're going to be calling upon a section of matplotlib called pipeplot. And the way that we're going to be able to call upon that from matplotlib is just simply going into your script saying import matplotlib.pyplot and then we're going to set an alias for matplotlib.pyplot as plt and really the reason being is because a creating an alias for such a long method call well module call makes your life a lot easier as well as plt is the alias that basically everyone uses in their code when they're calling upon matplotlib so we're going to just create that alias by simply saying as plt and then once we're done, what we're going to do next is actually import the pandas module. Yes, I know I said we were not going to be fixating on the pandas module. However, pandas module and the matplotlib really are a match made in heaven because these two really make it really simple so that you can combine them to prevent you from having a programmer's headache. And the way we're going to import the pandas module is like how we have always done. Where we're going to say import pandas as pd. And then the next thing we're going to do is take the data set that we got from the Kaggle API and convert that data set into a pandas data frame simply by using pd.readcsv and then we're going to call upon the file location just like this. So data equals pd.readcsv and we're going to do command V. Ooh. You need quotations inside of those parentheses and then enter. Now I do realize over the past few videos I've probably said this a lot, but it's really important to keep in mind when we're saying when we're setting data equal to pd.readcsv, what we're doing is we're setting all the values within that CSV file as a pandas data frame. And yes, I do realize a lot of you are coming to this video wondering about how the heck to simplify matplotlib and to be able to create very simple figures. I was in that same boat when I first got started with Python. Matplotlib can seem really intimidating at first, so bear with me and I'll show all of you how simple this can really be. Starting off with by creating our very first matplotlib plot, and the way that we're going to do this is first by calling upon our pandas data frame, which is data. Now the next thing we're going to call upon is the dot hiss method. The dot hiss method is actually not part of the pandas data frame. I mean pandas module, it's actually part of the matplotlib module. And what you're really going to see within this one line is how these two modules really are a match made in heaven because when I hit say hiss, it's going to be creating a pand well a matplot histogram based off all the information within our pandas data frame. Now if we were to hit run, Really, there will be two problems. One problem is our P Python interpreter doesn't know that our 
matplotlib module as well as our pandas module is working together as well as our Python interpreter doesn't know that's supposed to be showing some sort of figure. So the way we're going to overcome those two problems is by one simple answer and it's just by saying plt dot show and then parentheses at the end. So really all we have to do is do run the code right now and what we're going to see is actually yes this is a histogram and yes it's very squished together I knew this before I was coming in so don't X out of this video just yet and think I'm crazy the reason being that this is all mixed up like this is because by default the fig size which is this white box of matplotlib is this size when you have multiple plots which is what all these histograms are within one figure and you don't specify the fig size matplotlib is going to try jamming all those plots within that one small figure so the way we get around this is just by simply first xing out of this going back over to our hiss inside our parentheses and input argument we have to add is fig no not jiff fig size equals a tuple of 20 by 15 now or oh, not 29 reason why I picked 20 by 15 for our fig size is 20 by 15 should really allow you to see all the information within your monitor it's kind of like almost I guess you could say it's like essentially it should be able to fit within any screen and when we hit run now we're going to get a better idea of what's going on within our pandas data frame and notice there are nine columns when in reality we actually have ten columns reason being is because our ocean proximity column is actually an objects column like we went over in last video however object column can't be represented as a histogram therefore it's not going to be represented in the histograms for all of our pandas well all of our columns and honestly a lot of information can come from this data visualization of a histogram like for instance there's a lot of information within longitude latitude and housing median and then the rest of the data sets kind of look a little bland except for median house value however what you have to keep in mind is if all of these mod well all these plots were not as populated as it looks those plots would look a lot smaller allowing you to be able to visualize the data a lot better however since there's more information and the data goes up to such a high number we can't see all the information that we need to see that so, doesn't mean that we can't go into our data set pick out a name of a column and call upon the histogram for that specific column and the way that we're going to be able to do that is essentially simple. treating our pandas data frame just like a python dictionary and the way that we're going to well what i'm talking about is right after data before we call upon the hist method we're going to create two brackets then we're going to also enter in two quotations within those two quotations we're call, going to call upon one of the column names and i actually copied and pasted total bedrooms because that was one of the figures that we really had difficulty evaluating all the information that was within that one histogram so when we hit run now we're going to see now that yes the information actually does continue on all the way i want to say probably the best one that you guys can see right here that it's showing us that it's gradually decreasing and decreasing as it gets to about 600 the reason why I'm saying six about 600 is because if this plot was to not go past 500 we wouldn't have that 600 so I'm willing to bet that it ends somewhere around somewhere between 500 and 600 so histograms are a very powerful tool to have in your machine learning and artificial intelligence tool bag really for you to be able to evaluate what's going on to inside of all that data now the next plot that we're going to be talking about is something that I'm sure all of you have used in class before. The graph I'm talking about is actually the line graph and I'm sure the line graph was your best friend back in like first grade or maybe even second grade. Honestly I was not very good at math in any grade from K to 12 but honestly matplotlib really does allow you to implement a line graph super simple so why don't we head back over to a python script to actually implement this starting off by starting off with creating a brand new list and the reason being is because information within data is so huge that if we were to create a line graph based off of that information it would take a long time for us to generate that so for the sake of time we're going to be creating a new list called data oh well, new data and then we're going to set this equal to not an empty list but instead we're going to use list comprehension to cut down on not only memory but the amount of lines it's going to take to populate this 
list. And the way that we're going to do, well, the type of list comprehension we're going to do is we're going to use, say, i for i in range of, let's say, 10. So now that we've created this new list, we have to now take that new list and convert it into a pandas data frame. The way that you do that is just saying new pd or whatever you want your pandas data frame variable to be called equals pd dot data frame and then inside the parentheses new data now we have a brand new pandas data frame called new pd we have to take that pandas data frame and convert it now into a line graph which is going to look a lot like how we create that histogram by saying new data well new pd dot plot all right nothing has to go inside of there more specifically what i'm talking about is the figure the figure size reason being is because we're only creating one plot so therefore we don't have to worry about the figure size because we're not evaluating multiple different ones like we're doing with the histogram so once we've done that we also have to tell our python interpreter to show us the figure so plt dot show and then once we hit once we run this now we're going to see a very simple line graph yes a line graph is very simple something you probably don't expect to actually use with your machine learning or artificial intelligence models. However, it's something important to have, well, it's something good to have in your back pocket for when you do need it, because you never know when sometimes simplicity is the best option. And honestly, a line graph is something I would always have, well, a line graph is something I would really want to make sure I know how to create in certain circumstances just because of that. But the next plot that we're going to talk about is something that I use very often when visualizing my data for my machine learning and artificial intelligence models. The plot I'm talking about is actually a scatter plot. A scatter plot is honestly a very handy tool. I mean, honestly, out of all the plots we talked about in today's video, I really highly suggest that your number one should be the scatter plot because it allows you to see a whole boatload of different information for each plot, like how much concentration is one in, is in one area of your plot or how much is all over the place. Really, a scatter plot is an amazing thing to have and it's quite easy to create. As you all can see, right behind me is a Python script where we're going to implement this matplotlib scatterplot. And in order to actually do this, we need an x and a y value. Luckily for us, well, luckily slash unluckily for us, our x and y values are data within two specific columns. Now, in order to get those columns, well, the data within those columns, we need to know the columns' names. Luckily for us, pandas made it really simple for us to know what are the column names for our data set by simply coming over the script and saying print data which is our pandas data frame dot columns now when I hit enter and run this what's going to happen is we're going to it's going to return a list of all of our column names so control R and what we want is longitude and latitude the reason why we are going to be using longitude and latitude for this example you all can probably guess why Leave it down in the comment section down below if you have an idea, but I'm going to tell you all in just a couple of seconds why I picked longitude and latitude. So in order to actually implement this, well, in order to actually implement the scatter plot, what I'm going to do is copy this, comment this out, and then we're going to say plt.scatter. And then within the parentheses, we're going to say x equals data at column. And we don't want longitude and latitude. What we want is just longitude so we're going to end the brackets right there and then we're going to on the other side of that comma we're going to say y equals data at column latitude now just like all the plots we've done in today's video in order to actually see this plot what we have to do is go to the next line say plt dot show and then when we run this what we're going to get is a plot that looks a lot like california this is the reason why i specifically picked out this plot because honestly i think this is so cool how we can take all this information from this data set and create the state of california also it makes a lot of sense since we're using the california housing prices and inside of that california housing prices we have the coordinates of each house that they're talking about now we can't really see the data density of all the specific pieces of data and it would probably be very nice to actually know that since we're kind of looking at population right now of where all these houses are in order to actually do that what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to x out of this figure and we're going to now go inside of plt.scatter and we're going to add another input argument called alpha 
and I'm going to set alpha equal to 0 0.2. You can pick whatever number you want. I prefer 0 0.2 because it's, just, it's really just enough so that you can just see where it's not as where the data is not as dense, like all these light blue. But at the same time, it makes it very apparent where the density is very high by how it is dark, dark blue. Now, scatter plots, like I was saying earlier on, is something that you really should have in your back pocket for when you're trying to do some data discovery and, and data visualization with your data set. Let's not just stop there. I showed all of you guys really all the awesome stuff of Matplotlib. Now, let's take all that information and turn it into an absolute beast of a tool where we're going to be able to essentially plug in any data set that we want and get some sort of data visualization so we can have a full understanding of, of our data. The tool I'm talking about is actually being developed right behind me. That is going to be our data visualization class that's honestly going to make our lives a whole boatload easier. There's a lot of stuff going on in that class. For instance, we're going to be importing the pandas module, the matplot lob matplot Lario. No, I mean matplot module. Try saying that real fast. The PQT5 module, as well as the math module and the system module. All these modules combined is really going to allow us to have one heck of a data visualization tool. All this stuff that's going on really is going to make this class one heck of a class. For instance, instance, the very first thing we're actually going to conquer, and it's something that I really think really should be in this class, is we're going to actually automate figure, well, PLT to automatically notice what our screen size is and then adjust our figures accordingly. And the way that we're going to do this is by going into PLT and pulling a, more specifically, we're going to be making adjustments to a dictionary. That dictionary is RC params, and that key, the key term of the dictionary that we want to adjust is figure dot fig size. We're gonna set that dictionary, oh, well, that key term of that dictionary equal to self dot finding screen size. Where inside of screen size, we're going to be using a whole bolt. Well, we're going to be using two modules that we're talking about: the PyQt5 module as well as the Sys module. Those modules are going to allow us to find what our screen size is and then be able to return those values back to PLT to make those adjust those adjustments to our figures. And the way that we're going to be able to do this is by setting app equal to QT widgets .q applications of sys.argv. Now from line 35 to 36, really what that is is actually us filtering down app into a more digestible version of what we want, which is screen dot width and size dot width. I mean not screen dot width, size dot width and size dot height. QT widgets is getting the pixel value of our of our screen. So what we have to do is convert those pixel values into inches, which is why we're dividing size dot width and size dot height by 96. Now we have to return this tuple of screen size back to plt.rc params as a tuple more specifically because that's the format that fig size requires as well as this is going to therefore continue on with the rest of this software more specifically the next method well the next method is going to be a helper function that this method is actually pretty awesome in my opinion because it's what it's going to be doing is be looking for columns that have objects within them well they're columns that have a data types of objects now earlier on in today's video I mentioned how co well, object columns can't be represented in a histogram. That's not entirely true. The reason why it wasn't being shown up on the screen is because in machine learning and artificial intelligence world, we really don't want to be dealing with object columns really just because of how machine learning and artificial intelligent models don't like that and will be causing some errors. So therefore, because of that, we want to kind of like disregard that column until we can actually properly evaluate what is going on inside of that column. All right. So All right. Adam, so the way that we're going to be getting rid of a column that is an object column is by using the bye bye text method right here, where we're going to have two input arguments if I can stop highlighting, df, which is going to be some sort of pandas data frame that's gonna get passed into this method, as well as var list. Now, var list can be one of two things. A string representing the column within the pandas data frame that we want to be getting rid of, or we want to eva actually not get rid of, evaluate, or it can be a list of column names that we want to evaluate. The first thing we have to do once we have initialized this method is actually create a copy of our pandas data frame. Luckily for us, 
Pandas has made it very simple to actually copy over data to another Pandas data frame, which is exactly what we're doing on line 40. We're saying copy equals df.cop, which is that really nice method that Pandas has been able to bless us with. Now, the next thing we're going to be doing is just a regular count variable. There's nothing too special about this. After we define that count variable, what we're going to be doing afterwards is we're going to check to see what type of instance the var list is. If it is a string and this if statement is correct, we're going to see if that column that that string is supposed to represent is the object column by saying if copy of var list dot d types equals object we're going to just print out a statement to the screen saying hey user there's a little bit of an error here we can't really use this column however else means that the var list is actually a string where we'll be able to actually for loop through that string by saying for i in var list and then each instance of i we want to actually double check to see what data type that column is if that data type of that column is objects and this if statement is true then we're going to be popping var list dot pop at the instance of count this is the whole reason why we create that count variable up here on line 41 because this count variable is actually going to be keeping track of what cell we currently are in within our var list and then once that's done what we're going to do is then drop that column out of our pandas data frame by saying copy dot drop columns equals i therefore the reason why we're able to actually call upon the i is actually because i is supposed to represent each value within our list, all right? And then after that, we're going to say in place equals true. Now, if we were not to have this in place equals true, as soon as we move from this line, the column that we just dropped will be, get added back onto our pandas data frame. Therefore, the reason why we have this in place is actually to prevent that pandas data frame to get added back onto our column. Once that's done and we get past the count plus equals one, that's just making sure, like I was saying earlier, that count stays up with what cell we currently are within our list. We're going to be returning copy to the original method. All right, Tyler. So really, that is all the helper functions and all really the nitty gritty stuff of this class that we have to get done and out of the way. Now, the next thing we're going to be doing is actually going to be the very first plot that we ever talked about in today's video. And it's probably going to be the only, well, really the easiest method of this class. And what we're talking about is the histogram. And it's going to start off with us defining the figure size. We're going to say final size equals self dot finding. What was it? Finding screen size underscore. That's the method. Well, that's the helper method that we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. Now, the next line is where we're going to be creating our histogram. Nothing too fancy. What we're going to be saying is self.data.hist big size equals final size. And then we're going to be populating the screen with our figure by saying plt.show. As you all can see, this method probably really is going to be the easiest method that we're going to be creating because it's only three lines. Now the next method is going to be your one, your only, your favorite, the line graph. Yes, I was being a little sarcastic. Unless you really enjoyed first and second grade math, me personally, I want to be ripping my hair out when I was in elementary school trying to learn graph, especially when it came to the line graph. Honestly, me and math did not get along for the longest time, but really I... This may be one of the simplest plots that we created in today's video, but this as well as the scatter plot really had to be amped up a lot in order for this plot, well, this class to be a very diverse class, as you all will probably see in a couple of seconds. Where we're going to be going right to line 56, this is where the first instance of the creating the line. In fact, inside of the initializer, when we're saying if, where are you, if type of plot that upper equals line, call upon self dot line is the method that we're going to be going into right now now we're going within this method it's a very short method so it's not the complicated aspect i was just talking about but let's just continue on and you all see where it does start getting complicated and if is instance of self dot y is a list we're going to now send our data frame or our visualization of this line over to the df line method now the di the df line method is where this is going to be getting a little bit more complicated which we'll get into a couple of seconds in a couple of seconds 
But afterwards, if it's not a list and we want to just create a very simple line graph or a line plot, we're going to be going into plt.plot where we're going to plot a line graph of the X and the Y values. Now going on to the next thing is actually going to be creating that DF line method. Now what you all just saw was a fork in the road as far as what's going to be able to be produced with a line plot within this class. Now originally going into this creating this class I wanted it to be very diverse where you could either plot a regular plot I mean line plot or you could be able to plot a pandas line plot. Either way you wanted to go it would be a successful experience so therefore going into the pandas DF you're going it's going to be a little bit longer where it's going along what we got up on the screen right now where we have a count the reason why counts equal to one it will become very apparent in a couple of seconds but what we got going on on line 63 and line 73 are basically the same except one's evaluating x on line 73 and one's evaluating y and we're checking to see if which one is actually the list when we do determine that they're both identically the same where we're going to be having a copy equal to self dot by by text we're going to put in two input arguments self.data and self.y. The reasons why we were just going over when we we're talking about this method. Now what we're going to be doing once that copy is able to be established, we're going to be traversing through our self.y list or self.x, whichever one it falls on. Then afterwards, we're going to be getting the square root of all the length of our list. The reason being is because we want to really kind of make this thing, make this subplot, well, our subplots to be looking very nice. Now, what is a subplot? Well, what we're going to be doing is remember that little white box we had? We're going to be dividing that up into several different subplots inside of that figure, right? That's how we're going to be able to see multiple different plots within one figure. Now, the way that we're going to do this is by saying plt.subplot, and then right here, I could be wrong. I may have column and row mixed up, but essentially what you want to do is you want to specify how many rows of subplots you want, which is going to be this one as well as how many columns we're going to have, which is going to be this one. Now you can have a float value of a subplot, so that's why we have round of math.square root of the length of self.y. Now count is going to be whichever plot, that subplot, we're going to be populated at that current time of this for loop. Now if for some reason we're not able to turn this subplot, well, the square root of our length of the list, into a nice even number, we're going to be going into this else statement where basically we're calling upon the same subplot. However, in right here, when we're talking about the rows, we're adding plus one to get plus one to make to really account for that extra subplot that's going to be populated because of our data. Now, what we're going to be doing as soon as we get out of this else statement is actually creating the plot that's going to be populating whichever current subplot we are currently working with. And then afterwards, we're going to be doing count plus equals one. Then it's going to be exactly the same as what's going on if this was the same thing that would go on with our X. All right. Afterwards, what we're going to be doing coming down to this else statement is if the first two if else statements turn out to be false, therefore we're just going to be coming, we're just going to be creating a regular plot with self.data at key term of self.x as well as y equal to self.data of key term y. Now the last line is so that we can actually see the figures that we just created and we're just going to call upon plt.show. The next method is going to be very similar to this however we're going to be talking about the scatter plot again this is probably the number one plot that I use on an everyday average when I'm working with machine learning or artificial intelligent models and it's actually quite simple to actually implement what we're thinking about just because it's going to be very similar to how we were implementing the line plot and it's going to start off what we got over here on line 87 where it's going to be the beginnings of the scatter plot for this class now uh, really what you're going to be noticing is it's very similar however very different to when we were creating the two methods for the line plot the first difference you're going to notice is that we are checking the instance of self that data to see if it's a pandas data frame there's two reasons why i'm doing this is to show all of you that there's essentially more than one way to accomplish the same task so always keep that in mind when you're creating code as well as i want to show all of you how to be using the is instance to be using it against a, a piece of data that is not originally like a list or a dictionary or an integer you're able to really double check to see what type of data it is with really anything that's defined as a piece of data now once we have checked to see if data is actually a pandas data frame we're going to be going over to the self.df scatter if by some chance that this self.data or well, self.data is not a pandas data frame we're going to be just creating a regular scatter plot we're going to say plt.scatter equals f well equals x self.x 
and y equals self dot y and we're going to be defining the alpha equals to self dot alpha well the reason why we have this is so that we can really see those different gradients now by default alpha is always equal to none and by default our alpha is always equal to none now continuing on we're going to be talking about the df scatter df scatter right here on line 93 is basically identically the same as the df line there's really one difference and that is that instead of calling plt dot plot we're actually calling plt.scatter and it's going to be working very much similar to how we were calling plt.scatter over here and really that's all that's going to be going on with this class. all right now let's see the link right down here i'm not actually running today's code but if you go check out the link right here at github.com forward slash island robotics forward slash data visualization you will see the code go ahead and download it and run it yourself so you have this tool ready in your toolbox as well as this links down in the description bar down below really that's all i have for all of you in today's video if you enjoyed today's video and you really want to help out this channel go ahead and hit that like button if you're brand new to this channel please do consider becoming part of the community using python to learn applications of machine learning through demonstration as always happy coding and i'll see you all in the next video bye